Tonight, returning home. We want to make sure that uh, our fellow Americans are released. We are also focused on political prisoners. The late developing news tonight as the U.S. has negotiated a deal with Venezuela to release 10 detained Americans abroad. What we're learning about them tonight and who the U.S. gave in exchange and... We're now witnessing one of the longest wars in Israeli history. We're just on the edge of the kibbutz, about two miles from Gaza. As you can hear, the war is raging. This is a very active military zone. But despite all of this Israeli firepower, the whereabouts of Sinwa is unknown. He's the alleged mastermind behind the October 7th Hamas attack in Israel. In tonight's Prime Focus, we answer the question, who is Yahya Sinwar? The Hamas leader Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has dubbed a dead man walking. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following a lot of news tonight on those newly released Americans and much more. Including the hundreds of thousands still reeling after a massive winter storm barreled through the East Coast. Plus the new body cam footage from that horrific University of Nevada Las Vegas shooting earlier this month. More details on the gunman and the police response. And will the former president be barred from running for office in Colorado? The major constitutional crisis that could reach the Supreme Court and upend the 2024 election. But we begin with the holiday travel rush. With just five days until Christmas, this year is expected to be the busiest holiday travel season on record. And the extreme weather is certainly not making things any easier. In New Jersey, flooded roads turned to black ice due to the bitter cold. Take a look at this, a 13-car pileup, including trucks. The Passaic River in New Jersey cresting at the highest level in more than a decade, flooding a nearby neighborhood. And a state of emergency in Patterson, New Jersey, families rescued from their flooded homes. Many schools in the area now closed until further notice. In Maine, the Adruscoggin River is very high tonight. People living in low-lying areas are being told to evacuate. Tonight, that flood emergency is prompting additional evacuations across the Northeast, and a major storm out west is threatening the California coast. Our extreme weather team is covering it all tonight. Let's begin with ABC News meteorologist Ginger Z. Ginger, time this all out for us. Yes, so let's go ahead and say those Passaic River, amongst other rivers that were so high, could stay in major flood stage through Friday, at least that Passaic in New Jersey, but it will be receding. So what we need to time out is the next storm, and this has already started drenching parts of Southern California. What makes this interesting, and interesting in the way of also dangerous, is that they're coming off of a very dry period. So they'll get three to six inches over a broad area, mudslides and landslides possible, but there could be a target zone zone where you pick up five to ten inches really quickly. That's close to Santa Barbara and north of Los Angeles. But there will be other bullseyes as you make it down into the foothills, even down to the Mexican border right there in San Diego, also in the flood watch now. We also, Lindsay, see an elevated risk for dangerous flooding. That's not something you see very often. This is the second highest level that they issue. And so we want to make sure anybody in red there knows that you have a very rough 36 to 48 hours ahead. Let's go ahead and fast forward, though, because going Going to Christmas Day, which is the day that so many people have their eye on, that storm in part will mix with some other energies and then together will become a rainstorm in the middle of the country. For the most part, on Christmas, it is going to be a lot of people waking up much warmer than average, some people even close to records, and then rain and not <laughs> snow. A lot of people want a white Christmas, and I think you're really going to have to find some elevation in the Rocky Mountains or maybe in, you know, snowshoe West Virginia, if that's what you like. Oh, no white Christmas for the majority of us. All right, that's a bummer. Santa not delivering that, at least this year. Ginger Z, our, our thanks to you as always. Extreme weather is going to make for dangerous conditions on the roads and in the air ahead of what's expected to be an extremely busy holiday travel week. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. Tonight, the official launch of what could be the busiest holiday travel season ever. More than 47,000 planes in the air today. That holiday traffic predicted to peak with nearly 49,000 tomorrow. There's a lot of people going in many different directions. Just got to bring your patience. The TSA expecting to screen some 2.5 million passengers on average per day between now and Christmas. We will be fully staffed for the holiday. We have high confidence uh, that we'll be able to handle this volume. 
The FAA opening up military airspace along the East Coast to avoid any traffic jams in the air. As it announced, it will examine burnout among air traffic controllers. So far, it's a smooth start today for the millions hitting the skies. Finally check my bag. All I have to do is go through TSA and then relax the rest of the time. With just a few disruptions at LaGuardia Airport, the TSA says it removed 17 bullets hidden inside a diaper in one traveler's carry-on bag. And an unattended bag led to brief delays at Charlotte's Douglas International. I could miss my flight. Everybody here can miss their flights. Outrageous. Got to get there earlier. Thanks to Gio for that. Now to a high-stakes prisoner swap between the U.S. and Venezuela. Ten jailed Americans, many who were deemed wrongfully detained, are now headed home tonight after the U.S. released an ally of Venezuela's president. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. After months of secret, painstaking negotiations, tonight 10 Americans jailed in Venezuela are on their way home. They're in their aircraft on their way home to the United States. Six of them deemed wrongfully detained, including 38-year-old Savoy Wright, a California businessman arrested in October and held for ransom. And Avon Hernandez, a Los Angeles public defender who was taken into custody last year near the border, accused of being a spy. Venezuela is also sending back a fugitive criminal mastermind American law enforcement authorities have been trying to bring back since he escaped the U.S. last year. Defense contractor Leonard Glenn Francis, also known as Fat Leonard, the man behind a $35 million bribery scheme, the largest corruption scandal in U.S. military history. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to using prostitutes, luxury travel, and cash to bribe U.S. naval officers to steer lucrative contracts to his companies, a scheme he described in an interview for an investigative podcast produced by Project Brazen in 2021. Everybody was in my pocket. I had them in my palm. I was just rolling them around. <laughs> Just three weeks before his sentencing last year, Francis, under house arrest, staged a stunning escape, cutting off his ankle monitor. After weeks on the run, he was finally captured in Venezuela. In exchange for Francis and the 10 Americans, the U.S. is granting clemency to Alex Saab, a top ally of Venezuela's authoritarian president, Nicolas Maduro. Saab was arrested in 2020 for money laundering. Today, the two men back together at the presidential palace. Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, what impact does the current relationship between the U.S. and Venezuela have on today's developments? Well, Lindsay, this all comes as the Biden administration is really trying to improve relations with Venezuela. Back in October, the U.S. eased some sanctions after Maduro agreed to take steps toward free and fair elections. Now, only some of those steps have actually been taken, but today President Biden said they are seeing signs of progress. Lindsay. All right. Mary Bruce for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. The death toll in Gaza has now topped a horrifying 20,000 killed since the October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas. President Biden says there are very serious talks underway for a new ceasefire, but for many, talks are simply not enough as the global pressure builds for lives to be spared in Gaza. ABC's Britt Clenet is in the region tonight. Tonight. Oh, my God. Did you hear that? Yes, yes, we did. The moment civilians and journalists are caught in the middle of an Israeli airstrike. The Gaza death toll now crossing the horrific milestone of 20,000, according to the Hamas run health ministry. The White House tonight saying very serious negotiations are underway for a new ceasefire to get more aid in and hostages out. We're pushing it. We, I, I don't, there's no expectation at this point, but we are pushing it. Top Hamas leader Isma Haniya arriving in Egypt for indirect talks with Israel, mediated by the US and Qatar. Arwa Naif fled to Rafa with her husband, their two young boys and pets in tow, their fourth move since war erupted. Arwa telling me her children are her heroes for surviving under these circumstances. No child should have to go through this. Exactly. Especially if they don't understand. Even though you have nothing, completely nothing to do with all this fight, you can still be one of the death tolls or the injured or the casualties. No matter what's the number, we are just collateral damage. And Britt Klena joins us now from Israel once again. Britt, what is Hamas saying about another possible hostage deal? Lindsay, a Hamas official says they won't accept any hostage deal until Israel ends its aggression in Gaza. Meanwhile, you've got Prime Minister Netanyahu saying that, he, that they will continue to keep fighting until Hamas is eliminated, telling all terrorists, Lindsay, surrender or die.
Britt reporting once again for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Britt. Tonight, some Republicans are standing with former President Trump after Colorado Supreme Court banned him from the state's primary ballot because of his actions around the January 6th riot. President Biden was asked about the court case today and said he would not weigh in. But when he was asked, is Trump an insurrectionist, he had an answer for that. Here's Rachel Scott. Tonight, President Biden weighing in on that unprecedented decision by the Colorado Supreme Court that Donald Trump is disqualified from holding the office of president removing him from the state's primary ballot, arguing he incited an insurrection. Is Trump an insurrectionist, sir? Well, I think it's certainly self-evident. You saw it all. Now, whether the 14th Amendment applies or let the court make that decision. But he certainly supported an insurrection. And no question about it. None. Zero. The justice is citing the 14th Amendment, which bars anyone who had served in the federal government and then engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding office. The ruling pointing to Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election, including exhorting his supporters to march to the Capitol to prevent what he falsely characterized as an alleged fraud. Tonight, Trump's Republican rivals all condemning the court's decision. We don't need to have judges making these decisions. We need voters to have make these decisions. Even former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who has been Trump's toughest Republican critic, saying voters, not the courts, should decide. I do not believe Donald Trump should be prevented from being president of the United States by any court. I think he should be prevented from being president of the United States by the voters of this country. A lot of mixed thoughts here. Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. Rachel, what does the Trump campaign plan to do about this ruling? The Trump campaign says that they are going to fight this ruling with an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. We are told that could happen as early as next week, but clearly they think they could benefit off of this politically. The Trump campaign already fundraising off of that decision. Lindsay. Rachel Scott from the nation's capital for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. Michael Waldman joins us now. He's the president and CEO of the Brennan Center for Justice. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. You've actually written a book about the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, Trump's spokesperson has said that he's thinking that the U.S. Supreme Court is going to overturn Colorado's ruling. How do you see this all playing out? Well, I think Colorado's Supreme Court ruling will go to the Supreme Court. It was a very big deal. What the Colorado Supreme Court said is that Donald Trump was engaged in an insurrection and that under the terms of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, that means he's actually ineligible to be president. Uh, this has never been an issue that's come up before. We never had a president try to overthrow the result of, of the election before. Um, other courts in other states have ruled otherwise, and so the U.S. Supreme Court, whether it wants to or not, is, is going to take the case, probably. They may not go as far as making a, a ruling on everything the Colorado court said, they may try to find a way to avoid having to make a big ruling, but no doubt it's gonna be on their plate. For you as a, an expert in constitutional law, if the US Supreme Court does side with the Colorado Supreme Court, how do you see this impacting and playing out in other states? Well, if the, if the Supreme Court were to say, yes, uh, he's ineligible to be president, this would be a very big deal in constitutional law and in the politics of the country. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of legal questions that they'll have to, no doubt, wrestle with about who can bring the case, whether the timing is right. There are other cases, though. This is all part of the legal consequences finally coming home for January 6th and for what happened in 2020. The other big case where they are likely to make a ruling soon is on the question of whether, as Donald Trump claims, he's immune from prosecution uh, by Jack Smith, by the special counsel, uh, because he was once president. That is the case that has also not ever been heard by the Supreme Court before. That one is actually, I would say, as a legal matter, a pretty easy case. There's many, many reasons to think the president former president is not immune from prosecution uh, just because once upon a time they were president. Uh, but they've put the January 6th trial in Washington, D.C. on hold until this gets resolved. And so you think the Supreme Court is going to say, yes, he can be prosecuted? I, I would be very surprised if they didn't say he can be prosecuted. If you believe a president is not a king, if you believe a president is subject to the rule of law, you have to say that in some cases that they can be criminally prosecuted uh, if they engaged in criminal activity. Um, it's not a question necessarily of what they rule, but when, because everything's on hold right now. And that one of the complications here is, for example, Donald Trump is saying, hey, slow down considering 
whether I'm immune, but speed up making sure that I'm on the ballot in Colorado. So uh, it's all going to land on the Supreme Court's lap. Uh, you've said the potential for a second Trump term demands major reform. Explain what you mean by that. Well, it, it, you know, the, first of all, we need to make sure that we have election laws and voting laws where everybody can vote, where we have free and fair elections, and where we don't have the chance for people to try to overturn elections. Congress actually passed some good, strong bipartisan legislation, uh, but there are other things to do as well. I think uh, we need to look at our democracy and the way our democracy works and everything from redistricting and gerrymandering to voting rights, because it's not working so well. And interestingly, polls now show that the health of American democracy is one of the central issues for voters in 2024. It hasn't been that way in a long, long time, so I think it's gonna be a central part of the debate going forward. Michael Waldman, we thank you so much for your expertise. Really appreciate talking to us tonight. My pleasure. A jury will soon be deliberating the fate of two Aurora fire paramedics charged in the 2019 death of Elijah McLean. Closing arguments were expected in Colorado today after jury instructions. The two paramedics charged with reckless manslaughter and assault in McLean's death took the stand Monday and defended their use of the sedative ketamine, which has been blamed as the cause of McLean's death. Tonight, police released body cam video of the shooting spree on the campus of UNLV. The gunman, a longtime professor, had been rejected for a job at the school. He killed three professors who authorities say were not intentionally targeted, but they say the suspect did have a list. ABC's Mola Lange has more. Tonight, police in Las Vegas releasing heart-pounding body camera footage showing officers racing to the campus of UNLV as that professor, who was turned down from a job, opened fire. Open door to my right, open door to my left! Police trying to figure out if there was another gunman and where shots were coming from. They said they heard shots inside, so I don't know where that team is. A swarm of officers rushing into the building with guns drawn and alarms blaring as they move room to room trying to kick down doors, finding students huddling together, then rushing them to safety. This woman in a wheelchair carried down a staircase. Chilling video captured the final shootout as the gunman in a long coat chased an officer around a patrol car before he was shot dead by police. We got one down in front of the hall. Do we have another one in the, inside the building still? The suspect, Anthony Polito, had a target list, but police believe when he didn't find his targets, he killed three professors and critically wounded a fourth who just happened to be in the building. And Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, what else are we learning about the victims and the investigation? Well, Lindsay, that fourth faculty member who was also injured in that shooting remains in the hospital. As far as the investigation, it is ongoing. Police say they are reviewing even more video from that day, redacting portions of it, and that they'll be released once they're ready. Lindsay. All right, Mola Lange for us. Thanks so much, Mola. Just days after Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a new law that will give local police the power to arrest migrants suspected of entering the U.S. illegally, border agents say they encountered 10,500 migrants in a single day. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Eagle Pass, Texas, where nearly half of those crossing are passing through. Maria? Lindsay, there has been a steady flow of migrants funneling through the grassy pit that you see right behind me. You know, one bus takes a group and then another group shows up escorted by Texas military over by the riverbank. 44 apprehensions just yesterday in the Del Rio Eagle Pass area. Many of them will wait 10 to 12 hours at least to be processed and then some up to two days. Overnight, they will sleep on this dirt with no shelter, just the clothes on their back and those foil blankets as temperatures dip down in the 40s and the 50s. Processing facilities, they are full. Agents tell me that they are overworked and overwhelmed. And now local leaders are saying they are begging Congress and the administration to come up with some sort of solution, a compromise, because they do fear the problem you see behind me will only get worse. Lindsay? Maria, thank you. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The crime spree in Florida that started with the robbery of a convenience store and ended with a suspect setting his own house on fire. But next in our Prime focus, he's accused of masterminding the most deadly terror attack in Israeli history. Our Tom Sufi Burge takes us inside the mind of Israel's most wanted terrorist and the desperate search to find him. <laughs> Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. He's been called a dead man walking in Gaza's bin Laden. And according to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he's the country's most wanted terrorist after allegedly masterminding the horrific October 7th attack in Israel. But who is Yahya Sinwar? In tonight's Prime Focus, Tom Sufi Burge goes to Israel to find out. He's accused of masterminding the most deadly terror attack in Israeli history. A well-orchestrated and brutal operation. This offensive is the mission of his life. This is a jihad. Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, hasn't been seen since, and is thought to be hiding underground in a vast network of tunnels beneath the Gaza Strip. Israel's most wanted terrorist. Its military now focusing on his hometown, Khan Yunus. <laughs> For Israelis, Sinwar is the face of and brain behind the most heinous crimes. You know, he has a murder eyes. He is very, very smart. He is not a psychopath. When you're trying to find the seeds of this brutality of, the, of October the 7th, you must understand not only the ideology, but also the personality of Yehi Sanwar. <laughs> While for Palestinians who now chant his name in the streets, he's a symbol of resistance to Israeli oppression. He's a leader. He has a charisma. Yahya Sinwar grew up in a refugee camp. His parents reportedly displaced during Israel's War of Independence. Hamas, or Islamic Resistance Movement, designated a terrorist organization by many Western nations, was founded by the paraplegic imam, dressed all in white, Sheikh Ahmed Yassim. Sinwar, close to Yassim, was put in charge of Hamas's brutal internal security arm, the Majd, earning himself the nickname the butcher of Khan Yunus. He was uh, one of the commanders of the military wing and especially of the unit we, uh, who, uh, which uh, called Majd, which was uh, focused on finding and executing collaborators. In 1989, an Israeli court sentenced Sinwar to four life sentences for his role in killing suspected Palestinian informers and plotting to murder two Israeli soldiers. He spent the next 22 years in Israeli jails, including at Nafcha prison in the Negev desert. In the years he spent inside this prison, Sinwar's ruthless reputation evolved. According to one of his interrogators, he killed fellow inmates he accused of being collaborators with Israel. 
and he issued orders to other Hamas leaders. So I asked him during the interrogation why you are not married. How come you are Arabic, you are 29? He told me the Hamas is my uh, wife, the Hamas is my mother, the Hamas is my uh, father. So these are your notes from when you were working. Sinwar's interrogator was Micha Kubi, an officer in Israeli internal security Shin Bet, who still has some of his notes from hours of interrogation. Look, I interrogate with Yechia Sinwar at least 150, between 180 hours. He was very tough. And he says in those long conversations, Sinwar didn't hide his brutal methods. He killed 12 people by his hand. D did he almost boast to you that he killed those people? And, and did he even tell you? No, I can describe it, how come, how did he kill them? The, with machete, he preferred to kill. Machete? With machete, of course. That's the reason people of Gaza Strip called him, you know, the butcher of Khan Yunis. But that image of Sinwar isn't shared by one of his former fellow Palestinian inmates. Did people in the prison fear him? <laughs> Ismat Mansour was locked up with Sinwar for 15 years. He speaks Hebrew very well. He loves to know everything about the Israeli army, the Israeli intelligence, the Israeli uh, security. He, he knows his enemy very well. Yeah, very well. And inside the prison walls, Sinwar commanded respect. Look, he was admired by the whole prisoners, you know, even by the authorities of the, uh, the prison, even by. Even the staff working in the prison yeah, admired him. Even the staff, he convinced the staff and the manager of the prison to give them the best condition that they ever had. I mean, did that come down to his charisma or his ruthlessness or what? It's because his personality, you know. He know how to convince people to be with him. As Hamas launched a wave of suicide bombings across Israel, Sinwar looks set to live out his life in prison. But after Hamas rose to power, winning elections in Gaza, it traded a captured Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, for more than a 1,000 Palestinian prisoners including Yahya Sinwar. At the time, this Israeli intelligence officer was studying Sinwar, who was, he says, soon planning the deadliest terror attack in Israeli history. During this time, I was the head of the uh, Palestinian department in IDF intelligence. And I clearly remember how Yahya Sinwar started to plan this offensive. I'm quite sure that he knew that he could not defeat Israel in the, by this offensive. But, you know, According to his long-term vision, this was a very important station in the way to eradicate Israel from the map. Israeli intelligence failures leading up to October the 7th are now well documented. But the precise details of the plan were kept secret. That's the way that Sinwar worked. Uh, he, he preferred to work with a small and closed team. Sinwar's success at catching Israel off guard and smashing through what was supposed to be impenetrable lines of defense quickly turned into a massacre. The terrorists were given orders, says Israel, right from the top. During the months before the offensive, they had their lessons with religious leaders that told them, told them listen, you should uh, uh, see or consider the Jews and the Israelis as a germ, and you are allowed to, to, you know, to execute them in every brutal manner. It is okay from the religious point of view. And this is Yehye Sanwar's vision. The charred ruins of Kibbutz Berry, where 91 people were killed, speak of the horror committed here on that day. Some Palestinians say targeting civilians was a mistake. Taking Israeli civilians, taking women and babies hostage, that is definitely not compatible with, with uh, Islamic or even uh, Arab, Arab teachings. We're now witnessing one of the longest wars in Israeli history. We're just on the edge of the kibbutz, about two miles from Gaza. As you can hear, the war is raging. This is a very active military zone. But despite all of this Israeli firepower, the whereabouts of Sinwar is unknown. Hunting down Sinwar amid the rubble of Gaza has become a key part of Israel's mission. 
its ambassador at the UN. If you want a real ceasefire, here is the right address. Suggesting people who want a ceasefire should call Sinwa's number. And those who knew Sinwa believe he is still in Gaza and will probably fight to the end. He will not surrender. He wants to die as a hero of the Islam, as a hero of the Hamas, as a hero of the Gaza people. Our thanks to Tom Sophie Burridge for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, the chilling body cam video of a Texas police officer getting hurt during a shootout and how fellow officers ended up saving his life. But next, the 118th Congress on track to be one of the most unproductive in modern history. We'll take a look at just how many laws were passed and how much didn't get done at all by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone.
everyone. The 118th Congress is on track to be the most unproductive in modern U.S. history. And with the Senate adjourning for holiday break after failing to reach a deal on the Ukraine aid bill, we take a look at what's been accomplished and the work still left to do by the numbers. Just 20 bills have been passed by both chambers and signed into law this year. Another four are still awaiting President Biden's signature, according to Axios. That's far below what's historically been considered unproductive first years. By comparison, the 104th, 112th, and 113th Congresses passed at least 70 laws when Republicans controlled one or both chambers, with Democrats Bill Clinton and Barack Obama in office. And since 2011, we've seen five of the six most unproductive years in Congress. When you dig into the laws that were passed this year, they include several measures to rename the Veterans Affairs Clinics and one to mint a coin commemorating the 250th anniversary of the Marine Corps. When Congress returns starting January 8th, lawmakers have that Ukraine aid, which stalled amid a Senate deadlock and about two weeks to thwart another looming government shutdown. So let's hope with the new year also comes a new start for our elected leaders. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The cruise that set sail and ended up being a nightmare at sea. Why passengers set to go for a getaway to the Bahamas ended up in Boston. Plus, one-on-one -on -one with a Democratic congressman challenging Joe Biden, what Dean Phillips is saying about his Medicare for All legislation and why he should be the Democratic nominee for president. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. 
So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. A Florida man goes on a violent crime spree that ended with him setting his own house on fire. The cruise ship nightmare for passengers setting sail for the Bahamas. And some big changes could be coming to a Chick-fil-A near you. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. Florida's Volusia County officials say a man shot at deputies during an hours-long standoff before burning down his own home. The suspect accused of stealing cigarettes from a nearby gas station before leading police on a chase back to his house. Deputies ordered him out of the car, but he began shooting at them. The suspect then lit a fire that spread through his home, saying he would rather fight than surrender. SWAT teams eventually arresting the man. Houston police releasing a video of an officer exchanging gunfire with a suspect last month. That video shows Officer Valley shot in the arm. Guys, I got shot. Guys, I got shot. Come over here, I got shot. Other police officers quickly arrived and applied a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. Police had been called there after someone reported a nearby burglary. The suspects fled before Officer Valley caught up to them. Police say the suspect was also shot and pronounced dead on the scene. It's cold, cold light. We ain't blowing cold light. Officially cold. Passengers on board a ship out of New York were supposed to be headed for Florida and the Bahamas for a little holiday sunshine. But instead, they ended up going in the complete opposite direction, to Canada. The passengers were given the option to cancel their trip only 24 hours before the ship left port. MSC Cruise Line says quickly changing weather forced it to change the entire itinerary. A new bill in New York State could force Chick-fil-A's to open on Sundays. The bill would require food service contractors at rest stops on Interstate 90 to remain open on Sundays for customers. Since its founding in 1946, Chick-fil-A has always been closed on Sundays to allow employees to rest or worship. The New York State Thruway Authority says they would like to have at least one hot food option available on Sundays at the rest stops. And California looking for new ways to deal with water shortages. After facing extreme drought that brought reservoirs down to historic lows, California has approved new rules to allow water agencies to treat wastewater for public consumption. Water must be treated for pathogens and viruses. Officials say the treatment is so thorough that it removes minerals from the water, which must be added back in to improve its taste. In San Diego, there's hope that this recycled water could eventually supply nearly half the city's water. The numerals for the New Year's Eve Times Square celebration have arrived in New York City. The seven-foot-tall signage boasts 588 light bulbs and weighs over 1,000 pounds. The numbers traveled all the way from Los Angeles, stopping along the way so people could get a peek at the iconic sign. Eventually, crews will place it on top of the one Times Square building and light up the digits just in time for the ball to drop and ring in the new year. Recalled applesauce contaminated with lead has been linked to more than 200 cases, according to the CDC. The FDA first issued the health alert for the WANA Banna pouches just before Halloween. After a months long investigation by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the agency suspects the contaminated products were the result of a manufacturer cutting corners to save money. That's according to a senior official. No word from the company yet in response to that allegation. A local news helicopter operated by Philadelphia ABC station WPVI crashed in New Jersey, killing two people on board. It happened last night when the crew was returning from an assignment at the Jersey Shore. The station said the pilot and photographer died. Both had been members of the news team for years. Tonight, the names of these longtime news veterans, pilot Monroe Smith and photographer Christopher Doherty, have been released. Federal investigators are looking into how the crash occurred. To the race for the White House now, Democratic Congressman and presidential candidate Dean Phillips is making an appeal to progressive voters endorsing Medicare for all legislation. The Minnesota Congressman is running along with a very small number of Democrats against Joe Biden for the Democratic nomination. 
Phillips formally launched his campaign back in October in the battleground state of New Hampshire. And just last month, Phillips announced he will not seek re-election to Congress next year and focus on this presidential bid. Congressman Dean Phillips, kind enough to join us now. Uh, Congressman, I want to start with your endorsement for Medicare for All legislation. Why now, and is this in line with the direction of the party? Well, why now? It's, in fact, it's long overdue, Lindsay. Uh, we've been thinking about this for literally decades. Uh, Roosevelt and Truman, all the way to Richard Nixon, believe it or not, who proposed national health care for everybody. We've never gotten it done. And as a presidential candidate now for two months, I have to tell you the heartbreaking stories that I hear almost every day. Families going bankrupt because they're just one illness away from it. So many people, 40% of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency, 60% living paycheck to paycheck. We spend more for health care in the United States than any country in the world. Our outcomes are mid-pack. We pay more for pharmaceuticals, and it's a disaster. And nine, I think 26, I'm sorry, 26 million Americans have no health insurance at all, 90 million underinsured. And we've done nothing. So I am proposing Medicare for All. I want to have a thoughtful bipartisan negotiation because this affects red parts of America just as much as blue. And it is time, just as a country that affords public education for every child, we should be a country that ensures everybody has access to health care. It's long overdue. It's actually a very centrist, reasonable, common sense and moderate solution to a horrifying problem in the United States. Let's talk about the fight that you're waging against the current president. According to a recent Emerson College poll, Biden is leading uh, you in New Hampshire by 12 percentage points. You're also pouring a lot of your own money, a lot of your own time into this campaign. Without the backing or the support of the DNC, how do you garner the recognition nationally that's necessary to become president? Yeah, Lindsay, it's not easy. I'm working not to just not to just to win the nomination of the Democratic Party, but I'm sadly finding myself having to work against the Democratic Party that seems to be um, unwilling to practice democracy, and that's deeply troubling. I, I respect President Biden, but I also read numbers, I read polls, and I read national sentiment, and President Biden is not electable. He is going to lose to Donald Trump, and anybody who cares about the future for their children, their grandchildren, for this great country and our freedoms, uh, they're all under threat if we have another Trump presidency. So I believe in, it's important in the United States to have options for voters. Where do you differ from President Biden when it comes to actual policy? And I, I know that, that you think you're the man for the job, but I am curious, aside from his age, what makes you that man? Well, let's just talk about experience. Yes, President Biden has a lot of experience, but it's all inside the Washington Beltway, 50 years. I have led businesses, I've built them. I've been the chair of a board of a health system, a regent at a university, I've led a charitable foundation, and now I've served three terms in the House of Representatives. I was a member of House Democratic leadership, and I'm currently the ranking member of the Middle East Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs and the vice ranking member of the Small Business uh, uh, Committee. But in terms of policy differences, I support Medicare for all. I believe we need national health insurance for everybody. I also believe we have a crisis at the southern border that has been unaddressed, not just during the Biden administration, but historically for the better part of five decades. I favor the legalization of cannabis because most states have decided they want to, and it is incongruent with federal law. President Biden has not taken steps to do so. You know, we do have differences of opinion, but most of them are really relative to the future. And I'm proposing it's time for a new generation. I'm prepared, I'm ready, I'm competent, I'm a person of character, and I'm seeking people's votes because the alternative, Donald Trump, is going to be a horrifying disaster for everybody. Young voters are, are very clear. They do not like the way Biden is handling the Israel-Hamas war. How would you do things differently? I have called for an immediate ceasefire upon the release of the hostages, period. It should happen concurrently. It is time for a multinational peacekeeping force to enter Gaza, not to include Israelis and American soldiers. And then Hamas has got to be eliminated, Lindsay. It is one of the most atrocious terror organizations in the world. They are holding eight American hostages as we speak tonight for over two months. And if I were president of the United States of America, I would make that an issue front and center every single day. I would not rest until we extracted them or gain their release through our diplomatic channels. Congressman Dean Phillips, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay.
We turn now to lawmakers sounding the alarm about drug shortages across the country. Some of the limited supplies include life-saving cancer medications. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the latest. Crucial chemotherapy drugs are in short supply, forcing doctors to ration them, leaving some patients behind. We know how to treat cancer, but shortages force impossible choices. We have drugs that are life-saving and shortages that are life-threatening. Drugs that treat lymphoma and leukemia are among those federal regulators say are running short. Experts blame economics and a business model for generic drugs meant to keep costs low. A vial of sterile injectable medicine typically costs less than this cup of coffee that I bought downstairs this morning. So this reduces the incentive of manufacturers to invest in quality or in newer manufacturing facilities. It's not just cancer drugs. There are shortages of amoxicillin used to treat infections and a stimulant Kimberly Ward's daughter takes to control her ADHD. Adderall is the one that started this whole shortage. So you want me to potentially not have consistent medication for my daughter? Instead, really? Why? General Mills cut its annual sales forecast, suffering blows due to slowing demand for its higher-priced breakfast cereal, snack bars, and pet food products. Shares of the Cheerio cereal maker were down 1% in pre-market trading after it also missed second quarter sales expectations. High interest rates and sticky inflation are prompting consumers to opt for pantry staples from cheaper private label alternatives to pricier national brands. Repeated price hikes undertaken to offset high input costs have also pushed consumers to shop smaller resulting in a hit to sales for General Mills. And they are some of the keepers and guardians of the Amazon, but now the traditional songs of the Yawanawa people who have been around for centuries are being preserved by one of Brazil's biggest DJs. Here's my conversation with DJ Alok. Brazilian superstar DJ Alok knows music has the power to heal. He has an impressive reach with more than 28 million followers on Instagram and a staggering 5 billion streams on Spotify. This minister of music says one chance meeting changed his life. I went to a trip to Africa and then I met a woman, like an old lady. She was blind of two eyes. She was tightening her stomach to feel less hungry. And then she told me that she was praying for God, someone to go there and help her. And I said, like, listen, God doesn't exist. And if he exists, he abounds in you. And her answer changed my life forever because she said, no, I know him, and he's giving me the strange. You ended up answering that prayer. I didn't even believe in God back in days. I realized that moment that who abandoned her was us. When I realized that I couldn't abandon it anymore. We did a surgery in her eyes and she could see again. She changed my life way more than I changed her. It only makes sense to make all the success if I can somehow use this to transform this world in a better place. 32-year-old is now on a mission to heal the world, starting in his own huge backyard, using his platform to help protect the Amazon rainforest and its indigenous people. Tell us about your mission. The indigenous, they never had the opportunity to tell their own story. I'm just being this platform for them. Born Alok Ashka Perez Patrio, the Brazilian DJ made his professional debut at 19. By the age of 24, he was a national sensation. His early success didn't shield him from suffering through a dark period of the soul. You talk about being depressed and that you were looking for inspiration, and then that's how you met the, the group of indigenous people. Tell me about that moment. But I felt a huge emptiness. And I went to this very isolated tribe in Brazil. I spent 10 days with them. And while I was doing music to work, they were doing music for healing. So I was very disconnected with the nature and stuff. So I just started to change like how I can make this world a little bit better, you know? 
Alok's latest project, The Future is Ancestral, empowers indigenous communities to preserve their cultural heritage and protect the rainforests. The indigenous, they are the real guardians of it because they take care of more than 80% of the ecosystem of the forest. Okay our traditional knowledge. Thanks to that, we are preserving our forest. We are preserving the biodiversity. The Amazon is the world's largest rainforest. It covers about 40% of South America and plays a vital role in regulating our climate. Yet in the last decades, the rainforest has lost an area roughly the size of California due to unlawful logging and deliberate fires set to clear land for agriculture and cattle ranching, displacing many of the hundreds of indigenous tribes, causing the loss of their culture and language. O Brasil são mais de 305 povos, são mais de 274 línguas indígenas e fomos reduzidos a nem 1% da população. The ones I connected with the indigenous, man, I realized once you don't have consciousness about something, it's very normal that you do mistakes. Well, once you have consciousness, it's not a mistake anymore, it's a choice. And I had to do my choice. And the choice was just so obvious to me. And I hope it is obvious for others. The Alok Institute was created with the proceeds from a popular mobile game. I was invited to become a character on the most downloaded battle royale game. And when they asked me which superpower I wanted to have, what I learned with the indigenous, I said, is it possible to heal people? Mm -hmm. The superpower brought a different dynamic to the game, and Alok became the best seller. So I donated 100% of my royalties, and I found my institute. <laughs> The Alok Institute has been getting global attention. Brazil alone counts more than 200 indigenous languages. Preserving these languages all around the world is about protecting our common cultural heritage. I would also like to thank you, Alok, and the Alok Institute for bringing us together. The Yawanawa people recently joined Alok on a panel at the United Nations and gave a one-of-a-kind performance on the rooftop of its famous headquarters in New York City. What was your message for the United Nations? I think the most important is like to listen what the indigenous has to say. It is important, you know, that uh, humanity comes together now as a human family. We are not the history in the past. We are in the present, we are in the future. Alok hopes to introduce indigenous music to the world before it's lost forever. He's producing six albums of traditional and contemporary songs, and the indigenous performers will reap all the profits. I realized that I wanted to do an album inspired by indigenous roots. It's a very good way to translate what the forest has to say. I think people, when they listen to indigenous music, they feel touched by the heart. There were a lot of people working hard so that this world could be a better place and we can have more dignity. One tune at a time, Alok is taking his Ministry of Music, trying to heal the wounds of our world. Meaningful and powerful, our thanks to Alok for that conversation. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, the flood emergency in the east with warnings from Virginia to Maine. Ginger Z is tracking the forecast. Plus, lawmakers are sounding the alarm about drug shortages in the U.S., the limited supplies that include life-saving cancer medications. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, 
This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the hundreds of thousands still reeling after a massive winter storm barreled through the East Coast. Plus, the new body cam footage from that horrific University of Nevada, Las Vegas shooting earlier this month. More details on the gunman and the police response. And will the former president be barred from running for office in Colorado? The major constitutional crisis that could reach the Supreme Court and upend the 2024 election. But we begin with the holiday travel rush. With just five days until Christmas, this year is expected to be the busiest holiday travel season on record. And the extreme weather is certainly not making things any easier. In New Jersey, flooded roads turned to black ice due to the bitter cold. Take a look at this. A 13-car pileup, including trucks. The Passaic River in New Jersey cresting at the highest level in more than a decade, flooding a nearby neighborhood. And a state of emergency in Patterson, New Jersey. Families rescued from their flooded homes. Many schools in the area now closed until further notice. In Maine, the Adjuscoggin River is very high tonight. People living in low-lying areas are being told to evacuate. Tonight, that flood emergency is prompting additional evacuations across the Northeast, and a major storm out west is threatening the California coast. Our extreme weather team is covering it all tonight. Let's begin with ABC News meteorologist Ginger Z. Ginger, time this all out for us. 
Yes, so let's go ahead and say the Passaic River, amongst other rivers that were so high, could stay in major flood stage through Friday, at least that Passaic in New Jersey, but it will be receding. So what we need to time out is the next storm, and this has already started drenching parts of Southern California. What makes this interesting, and interesting in the way of also dangerous, is that they're coming off of a very dry period. So they'll get three to six inches over a broad area, mudslides and landslides possible, but there could be a target zone Zone where you pick up five to ten inches really quickly. That's close to Santa Barbara and north of Los Angeles. But there will be other bullseyes as you make it down into the foothills, even down to the Mexican border right there in San Diego, also in the flood watch now. We also, Lindsay, see an elevated risk for dangerous flooding. That's not something you see very often. This is the second highest level that they issue. And so we want to make sure anybody in red there knows that you have a very rough 36 to 48 hours ahead. Let's go ahead and fast forward, though, because going to Christmas Day, which is the day that so many people have their eye on, that storm in part will mix with some other energies and then together will become a rainstorm in the middle of the country. For the most part, on Christmas, it is going to be a lot of people waking up much warmer than average, some people even close to records, and then rain and not <laughs> snow. A lot of people want a white Christmas, and I think you're really going to have to find some elevation in the Rocky Mountains or maybe in, you know, Snowshoe, West Virginia, if that's what you like. Oh, no white Christmas for the majority of us. All right, that's a bummer. Santa not delivering that, at least this year. Ginger Z, our, our thanks to you as always. Now to that flood emergency in the Northeast. ABC's Trevor Alt is in hard hit Patterson, New Jersey. Tonight, neighborhoods underwater that's still rising days after storms moved out. This is a scene that we have seen over and over again of people getting rescued from their homes. Multiple rivers in New Jersey still in major flood stage. Boats and high water vehicles in hard hit Little Falls ferrying freezing families and pets to safety, including nine year old Alicia Eusidio. When you saw them come up in the boat, what were you thinking? That finally I can leave this cold place. Ana Jimenez waited two days for the water to recede. We had to leave because our heat went out. So, you know, with the kids and I'm expecting we couldn't do it anymore. It's extremely dangerous. You know, you could have the gas start going into the homes. You could have an explosion. You could have wire shortages. Oh, there is a person in that vehicle. Overnight first responders pulling a driver from this stalled vehicle in Patterson and up in Maine, new evacuations. First responders using airboats to save eight people trapped in the town of Casco. Bridges left damaged, roads washed away, and Governor Janet Mills warning power won't be fully restored for several more days. Some are going to spend Christmas in the dark. Trevor all joins us now from Patterson, New Jersey. Trevor, when can we expect the river there to drop below flood stage? Yeah, Lindsay, the Passaic River may not dip below flood stage until next week, and you can see what residents are dealing with in the meantime. Still water all the way up to some of their doors. They've actually now canceled school for the rest of the week because of this flooding. Lindsay? Oh, wow. All right, Trevor, all our thanks to you. The extreme weather is going to make for dangerous conditions on the roads and in the air ahead of what's expected to be an extremely busy holiday travel week. Here's ABC News transportation correspondent Gio Benitez. Tonight, the official launch of what could be the busiest holiday travel season ever. More than 47,000 planes in the air today. That holiday traffic predicted to peak with nearly 49,000 tomorrow. There's a lot of people going in many different directions. Just got to bring your patience. The TSA expecting to screen some 2.5 million passengers on average per day between now and Christmas. We will be fully staffed for the holiday. We have high confidence uh, that we'll be able to handle this volume. <sighs> The FAA opening up military airspace along the East Coast to avoid any traffic jams in the air. As it announced, it will examine burnout among air traffic controllers. So far, it's a smooth start today for the millions hitting the skies. Finally check my bag. All I have to do is go through TSA and then relax the rest of the time. With just a few disruptions at LaGuardia Airport, the TSA says it removed 17 bullets hidden inside a diaper in one traveler's carry-on bag. And an unattended bag led to brief delays at Charlotte's Douglas International. I could miss my flight. Everybody here can miss their flights. Outrageous. Our thanks to Gio for that. Now to a high-stakes prisoner swap between the U.S. and Venezuela. Ten jailed Americans, many who were deemed wrongfully detained, are now headed home tonight after the U.S. released an ally of Venezuela's president. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. 
After months of secret, painstaking negotiations, tonight 10 Americans jailed in Venezuela are on their way home. They're in an aircraft on their way home to the United States. Six of them deemed wrongfully detained, including 38-year-old Savoy Wright, a California businessman arrested in October and held for ransom. And Avon Hernandez, a Los Angeles public defender who was taken into custody last year near the border, accused of being a spy. Venezuela is also sending back a fugitive criminal mastermind American law enforcement authorities have been trying to bring back since he escaped the U.S. last year. Defense contractor Leonard Glenn Francis, also known as Fat Leonard, the man behind a $35 million bribery scheme, the largest corruption scandal in U.S. military history. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to using prostitutes, luxury travel, and cash to bribe U.S. naval officers to steer lucrative contracts to his companies, a scheme he described in an interview for an investigative podcast produced by Project Brazen in 2021. Everybody was in my pocket. I had them in my palm. I was just rolling them around. <laughs> Just three weeks before his sentencing last year, Francis, under house arrest, staged a stunning escape, cutting off his ankle monitor. After weeks on the run, he was finally captured in Venezuela. In exchange for Francis and the 10 Americans, the U.S. is granting clemency to Alex Saab, a top ally of Venezuela's authoritarian president, Nicolas Maduro. Saab was arrested in 2020 for money laundering. Today, the two men back together at the presidential palace. Thanks to Mary for that. Tonight, some Republicans are standing with former President Trump after Colorado Supreme Court banned him from the state's primary ballot because of his actions around the January 6th riot. President Biden was asked about the court case today and said he would not weigh in. But when he was asked, is Trump an insurrectionist, he did have an answer for that. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, President Biden weighing in on that unprecedented decision by the Colorado Supreme Court that Donald Trump is disqualified from holding the office of president, removing him from the state's primary ballot, arguing he incited an insurrection. Is Trump an insurrectionist, sir? Well, I think it's certainly so, so self-evident. You saw it all. Now, whether the 14th Amendment applies, I'll let the court make that decision. But he certainly supported an insurrection. There's no question about it. None. Zero. The justice is citing the 14th Amendment, which bars anyone who had served in the federal government and then engaged in insurrection or rebellion from holding office. The ruling pointing to Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election, including exhorting his supporters to march to the Capitol to prevent what he falsely characterized as an alleged fraud. Tonight, Trump's Republican rivals all condemning the court's decision. We don't need to have judges making these decisions. We need voters to have make these decisions. Even former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who has been Trump's toughest Republican critic, saying voters, not the courts, should decide. I do not believe Donald Trump should be prevented from being president of the United States by any court. I think he should be prevented from being president of the United States by the voters of this country. The death toll in Gaza has now topped a horrifying 20,000 killed since the October 7th attack on Israel by Hamas. President Biden says there are very serious talks underway for a new ceasefire, but for many, talks simply are not enough as the global pressure builds for lives to be spared in Gaza. ABC's Britt Clenet is in the region tonight. Tonight. Oh, my God. Did you hear that? Yes, yes, we did. The moment civilians and journalists are caught in the middle of an Israeli airstrike. The Gaza death toll now crossing the horrific milestone of 20,000, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. The White House tonight saying very serious negotiations are underway for a new ceasefire to get more aid in and hostages out. We're pushing it. We, I, I don't, there's no expectation at this point, but we are pushing it. Top Hamas leader Isma Haniyeh arriving in Egypt for indirect talks with Israel, mediated by the US and Qatar. Arwa Naif fled to Rafa with her husband, their two young boys and pets in tow, their fourth move since war erupted. Arwa telling me her children are her heroes for surviving under these circumstances. No child should have to go through this. Exactly. Especially if they don't understand. Even though you have nothing, completely nothing to do with all this fight, you can still be one of the death tolls or the injured or the casualties. No matter what's the number, we are just collateral damage. Our thanks to Brent for that. 
A local news helicopter operated by Philadelphia ABC station WPVI crashed in New Jersey, killing two people on board. It happened last night when the crew was returning from an assignment at the Jersey Shore. The station said the pilot and photographer died. Both of them had been members of the news team for years. Tonight, the names of these longtime news veterans, pilot Monroe Smith and photographer Christopher Doherty, have been released. Federal investigators are now looking into how the crash occurred. Tonight, police released body cam video of the shooting spree on the campus of UNLV. The gunman, a longtime professor, had been rejected for a job at the school. He killed three professors who authorities say were not intentionally targeted, but they say the suspect did have a list. ABC's Mola Lange has the details. Tonight, police in Las Vegas releasing heart-pounding body camera footage showing officers racing to the campus of UNLV as that professor, who was turned down from a job, opened fire. Open door to my right, open door to my left. Police trying to figure out if there was another gunman and where shots were coming from. They said they heard shots inside, so I don't know where that team is. A swarm of officers rushing into the building with guns drawn and alarms blaring as they move room to room, trying to kick down doors, finding students huddling together, then rushing them to safety. This woman in a wheelchair carried down a staircase. Chilling video captured the final shootout as the gunman in a long coat chased an officer around a patrol car before he was shot dead by police. We got one down in front of the hall. Do we have another one in the, inside the building still? The suspect, Anthony Polito, had a target list, but police believe when he didn't find his targets, he killed three professors and critically wounded a fourth who just happened to be in the building. Really chilling video there. Our thanks to Mola. With the holiday shopping season underway, many Americans are looking for safer ways to pay. Tap to pay transactions are estimated to grow by more than 150% over the next few years. As this method becomes more popular, ABC's Becky Worley explains how safe they are to use. Tap to pay. First, the tech. Two devices, your phone and the payment reader, communicate wirelessly. That transmission is encrypted, meaning it can't be intercepted by a hacker. It's a really great technology that helps reduce a lot of the friction of purchasing. Android, Apple, and Samsung phones all have digital wallets built in. You set them up by adding a credit card or a debit card. You can even use a prepaid card. I have an iPhone, so I just double click on the side and up pops my wallet app. I select the credit card I want to use. I just tap, and the purchase is charged just like I used a regular credit card, except it's faster and easier than using plastic. But for a lot of people, the reason they aren't doing this is they worry about safety. Some people are still hesitant on using digital wallets because it's weird to not have that card information directly in front of you. Your plastic credit card, though, has a vulnerability. If someone gets the number and the date and code on the back, they can make charges. But when your phone communicates with an e-reader, it doesn't share that credit card number. It creates a one-time use number that is useless to a thief. It's called tokenization. The reason tokenization is really helpful is that it creates a level of encryption that we just can't get with physical cards. Google says digital wallets provide added security, and Apple adds it's safer than using a physical credit, debit, or prepaid card. Okay, but what if your phone gets stolen? In order to use the digital wallets on watches or phones, your device must have a password. All right, all makes a lot of sense there. Thanks to Becky for breaking that down for us. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, trying to find common ground can be difficult, especially among people with differing viewpoints. I'll introduce you to an author who writes about how one of the most famous figures in American history found success among those he disagreed with. But next, the doctor's strike in England, what they're demanding from the British government. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling 
traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, how cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. Hey, yo, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Thousands of people have been forced to flee in Sudan as fighting has now reached one of the country's largest cities, once considered a safe haven for the displaced. As many as 15,000 civilians have fled Wad Madani. Fighting first erupted in the North African nation back in April after weeks of tensions linked to a planned transition to civilian rule. Doctors in England are on strike over pay at one of the busiest times of the year. The physicians, who are in the early stages of their career, started a three-day strike today in a long-running dispute with the British government over pay levels. Patients in Britain's state-owned National Health Service have been warned to expect significant disruption as thousands of appointments and procedures get postponed or even canceled. The strike, as of now, is set to end Saturday morning. And in China, Disney's very first Zootopia-themed attraction is now open in Shanghai. It opened to the public today, aiming to capitalize on a post-pandemic desire for travel there. Zootopia, which came out in Chinese theaters back in 2016, remains one of the highest grossing imported animated films ever released in the country. In today's divided political landscape, it can be difficult to find common ground with those who have differing viewpoints. But our next guest writes about how one of the most famous figures in American history grew into the figure he's known today by working directly with those he disagreed with. Steve Inskeep is the author of Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. He's also, of course, the esteemed host of NPR's Morning Edition and Up First podcast. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Esteemed. Thank you very much. <laughs> esteemed, very of kind course. Of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so many people, when they talk about Abraham Lincoln, they really talk about the legacy-defining moments, how he was able to tackle the, the Civil War, Emancipation Proclamation. But you decided to really take a look at him as a man. Why, why decide to, to look at it in that perspective? Well, I was looking at the little political moments that added up to those gigantic achievements. Uh, obviously, it's not that Abraham Lincoln got along with everybody. He was a wartime president. He fought a civil war against people uh, who disagreed with him that strongly about slavery. Slavery. But in order to win that war, in order to have opposition to slavery in the United States, he needed to build a coalition of people who had widely divergent views on slavery, widely divergent views on many other things, or just personal differences, and he had to bridge those divides to build coalitions. Hey, you talk about those personal divisions, those personal differences that he had. You talk about, in particular, 16 encounters he had with people yeah. with differing viewpoints. Why was it so important to look at it in that way? Um, I felt that if I was able to tell his life story through a series of meetings with people who differed with him, who generally disagreed with him, who came from different backgrounds, different races, different genders, that I would get a picture of America and also a picture of this political leader in action, in the same way that you would best understand an athlete and their art by watching them on the court or on the field. The way to understand Lincoln, I felt, was to see him in action face to face with individuals. Talk to us about the interaction in particular between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Oh goodness, this is one of my favorite meetings and a famous one. Douglass supported Lincoln but was also a critic of Lincoln. 
and went to Lincoln's office in the White House in 1863 to say, thanks for the Emancipation Proclamation. It's great that you are finally enlisting black men in the Union Army, which I had advocated long before you did. So great that you're doing that. But they're not receiving equal treatment. Why aren't they receiving equal pay? Why aren't they receiving promotions and equal benefits to white soldiers? And Lincoln had to explain that. He said political reality forced him to move more slowly than he would have liked and continued down the road after that meeting. Ultimately, black soldiers did get equal pay. But that confrontation, I thought, was very revealing about both of these very practical, pragmatic men. They disagreed on a lot, but understood that they needed to work together. During his time, it feels like Lincoln, in many scenarios, was kind of in the minority. For example, his opposition yeah. of slavery. What do you think that said about him? Oh, my goodness. Um, I find him a fascinating character because he chose to be in the minority party in his state when he was coming up in politics in Illinois in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, and he tried to assemble a coalition around this issue where you couldn't really get a majority point of view for anything. There were many different points of views about slavery, many of them trying to avoid the issue in different ways, and it was hard to get a majority that confronted the issue. It feels like in today's political landscape, often you have the people who are on the left, we're, we're only talking to the people on the left, we're not dealing with those crazy people on the right, or vice versa, yeah. right? Do you feel like that art has, has been lost yeah. today? Yeah, yeah, and I will hear people, as I've talked about this book, I will hear people who say, why would I even try to to talk to these crazy people on the other side. They are divorced from reality. They hate me. They don't even accept my humanity. These are things that people will say. And I have to accept that in many cases that may well be true. You're not going to get along with everybody. You're not going to get everybody to see your side. But that's not really the point. The point is, in a democracy, can you build enough people to form a majority for your side? And even if the people in that majority don't agree on everything, maybe uh, even if it's only one out of 10 things that you agree on, can you get that one big thing done? Steve Inskeep, we thank you so much. What a fascinating read. Want to let our viewers know, Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, the elf on the shelf helping to spread holiday cheer to the tiniest and most vulnerable patients in the NICU. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. Elf on the shelf spotting at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. The elf is helping to spread holiday cheer to the hospital's tiniest and most vulnerable patients in the NICU. Reporter Mary O'Connell from our partner station WFTS shows us how a small gesture means the world to these families in tonight's local lowdown. This hospital room is the bowling family's normal this Christmas. Laurel is seven and a half weeks old. She was born at 30 weeks and she has been here growing ever since. 
Miriam Bowling's daughter is in the NICU at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Still, these families are getting a taste of the holiday season, thanks in part to Laura Straub, the NICU nurse behind their Elf on the Shelf project. Outside of doing medicine, this is actually another one of my passions. Straub sets up hospital scenes with Barbies while welcoming in the Elf that joins them every December. Sometimes the scenes change daily. They even have miniature items that are replicas of what they use in their NICU. You. I made these out of little cray things. So how what we use to wash the babies. This is a little piece of our actual scrubbers. This elf is aware of infection prevention protocols, so it can't go back to all the bedsides. Instead, it usually visits right at the front desk. Our babies don't know if their room's decorated. They don't know if we're doing these celebrations, but their parents and their siblings and their families do, and it's really important to them. The nurses' efforts don't go unnoticed spreading cheer to families who need it most. Seeing the elf with all of the little baby dolls and all the formula and all the things, it, it makes it more normal, but it's still Christmas. So much needed joy there. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis, ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the nation's capital, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. There's little food for all of the 30 people. We hope cousins to end this situation in the near, near, near time. These are the voices of Americans trying to escape Gaza. Tonight, we're with the families here at home as they try to get their loved ones out. They say it's a race against the clock. As the death toll of the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza reaches nearly 20,000. 
The struggle to survive intensifies daily. Desperate Palestinians crowding aid trucks coming through the southern Gaza border this weekend. Caught in the middle of a large-scale Israeli air and ground offensive, an estimated 300 Americans, permanent residents, and their immediate family members urgently trying to make it out alive and come back home. For them, every day is a year, and every day the situation in Gaza changes, and it's only for the worse. Family members back in the U.S., like Yasmin Ilaga, say every passing minute is of the essence. Every day that they are not evacuated, their lives are exponentially more at risk. Her cousins, 20-year-old Hashim and his younger brother, 18-year-old Burak, who were born in Chicago, among those Americans trapped in the war zone. They were supposed to be here with me in my home right now, 